Amen. So keep your place there in John chapter 2. We see a couple interesting stories in John chapter 2, but we're going to look at the story kind of in between, right in the middle of the chapter. And this is a topic that I don't think I've actually ever preached on um, before tonight. But look down at John um, chapter 2 and verse number 13, which is interesting. You preach 150 sermons a year, you know, give or take, and you do that for several years. Pretty much uh, every topic will be covered. But I don't think I've specifically preached a sermon on this topic, so we're going to look at it this evening. Look down at John chapter 2 and look at verse number 13. The Bible says, And the Jews' Passover was at hand. So this is right after Jesus turned the water into wine. He just started his ministry. And the Bible says, And after the Jews' Passover was at hand, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem and found in the temple those that sold oxen and sheep and doves and the changers of money sitting. And when he made a scourge of small cords... He drove them out of the temple and the sheep and the oxen and poured out the changers' money and overthrew the tables. And said unto them that sold doves, take these things hence, make not my father's house an house of merchandise. And his disciples remembered that it was written, the zeal of thine house hath eaten me up. And if you have um, a bulletin um, in front of you, this is actually the verse of the week, this prophecy um, about what Jesus would do here in Psalm 69, verse number 9, where the Bible says, The zeal of thine house has eaten me up. So this was a Jesus-fulfilling prophecy when he actually turned over the tables of the money changers in the temple in this story. Now, Jesus actually did this twice. So this is the first time that he did it in Jerusalem, um, where he turned over the money changers' tables in John chapter 2. He also did it in Matthew, later on in his ministry, in Matthew chapter 21. So he did it twice um, in his ministry. And that's what we're going to talk about um, tonight. And we're going to talk about this idea of selling in church. This idea of, you know, selling merchandise in church. I'm thinking about opening up a coffee shop and maybe selling some cookies. So I want to just preach. No, I'm just kidding. I'm going to actually preach on why you should not sell in church and why that Jesus was so upset with this situation. First of all, before we get into the sermon, let me just point out here that this idea that we're told as Christians that you should never get angry is false. Okay? Because look at, turn to Ephesians chapter 4. Let's just do an introductory point here. Um, turn to Ephesians chapter 4 that this idea that all anger is wrong. Okay? That you should just never get angry ever, no matter what. Okay? Look, Jesus was without sin. Like, he was tempted like we were, but without sin, the Bible says. Jesus did not sin. And are you going to tell me that he sat down and he literally made a whip? He made a scourge of small cords. He made a whip. He went into the temple. He flipped over the tables and he dumped out the money. And he, you know, just ch he literally whipped them out of the temple here. This kind of goes against, you know, this picture of Jesus that we're taught today that Jesus is like this long-haired hippie sitting in a, in a field, Indian style, you know, with his hands like this or whatever. And it just, Jesus was angry here. He was upset with this situation. You say, well, how could you be angry? How could you be angry? Isn't that, isn't that bad? Isn't that wrong? Look at Ephesians chapter 4 and look at verse number 26. Before we even get into the topic tonight, let's just address this issue. The Bible says, be ye angry and sin not. Right there, that statement is saying that it's possible to be angry and not sin. It says, be ye angry, meaning ye, meaning he's talking to a group of people. So what he's saying in this statement, he's saying, he's like, look, when you get angry, don't sin. Perfectly implying that there is a way to be angry without sin. Okay? Let not, then, then he explains further, he says, let not the sun go down on your wrath. In Proverbs chapter 14, verse 29, I'll just read it for you. The Bible says, he that is slow to wrath is of great understanding. It doesn't say, he that hath no wrath is of great understanding. It says, he that is slow to wrath. So what the Bible says, look, this is not the point of the sermon tonight, but what the Bible says about anger, about wrath, is look, look if you read the Bible, there's a lot of wrath in the Bible. And most of it's coming from God. Okay, but what God is saying is that if you want to be angry, if you want to have a righteous anger, you can't, be, you can't be quick to anger, number one. So you can't be this person that just like somebody does something wrong to you and you're just like, you're angry right away. You can't just be this person that just like goes crazy on people immediately. This is like the road rage person, right? They're out driving, 
and somebody like does the light goes green and the person doesn't immediately speed off like it's a NASCAR race. They they wait half a second and this person's like on their horn, right? This is a person that's very quick to anger. They're very quick to wrath. They're just, you know, have you ever met that type of person that they just they just snap on people? They just, you know, they just kind of go crazy on people. Look, that's a sin. If you're quick to anger, that is not sinning not when you're angry. Okay, so the Bible says two things. You should be slow to anger. You know, how do you be slow to anger? Well, what's the Bible say? You're supposed to be just full of mercy. You're supposed to be full of mercy to people. You're supposed to be granting forgiveness. You have a friend that just keeps messing up over and over. You're supposed to be granting mercy. You're supposed to forgive that friend. You're supposed to be, look, it's not saying you can never be angry. It's just saying be slow to anger. And then, and this is a good one for married people right here. He says in Ephesians chapter 4, he's like, let not the sun go down upon your wrath. It's saying, like, don't, like, let your wrath, I mean, it's saying literally there, just get it taken care of that day. Don't, don't let it fester in you. Don't let it fester inside you, because guess what? Then it turns into bitterness. Then it turns into all sorts of ugly things. So be slow to anger. Be patient with people. Be long-suffering. That's one of the qualifications for someone to go into the ministry to be a pastor, is you must be long-suffering. You must not be this person that's just like, just snaps on people in, in a second. Be slow to anger and get it taken care of. And that's where the Bible gives us all these great, you know, processes to handle, you know, you know, conflicts between brothers and sisters in Christ, Matthew 18, all these different things, two or three witnesses, all these specific processes so we can just get these things taken care of quickly. You shouldn't just stay angry at somebody, go behind their back and, you know, try to turn a bunch of people. Look, that's sinning. That is, that is against what the Bible says. Be slow to anger, be merciful, be forgiving, and get it taken care of. Don't let anger just be a part of who you are. But all that to say this, Jesus was angry here. Jesus was angry. He wasn't, he wasn't quick to anger. He literally sat down. I don't know how long it takes to make a whip. I've never really made a whip before, but he literally sat. He saw what was going on. He sat down. He made a whip, and then he literally drove these people out of the temple, flipped over the tables. I mean, are you going to tell me that he was like, excuse me, excuse me, um, I have this whip here. Excuse me, could you, could you get aside and just, you know, excuse me, can I turn this table over, please? No, he was mad. He was flipping tables over. He was literally driving. It said he drove them out of the temple. It paints quite a picture. So all that to say this, many churches sell merchandise today. Jesus said, make not my father's house and house of merchandise in verse number 16. And his disciples remembered the prophecy. But many churches sell merchandise today. They sell, I mean, they sell all kinds of things. You know, there's, they sell coffee, they sell food, they sell DVDs, CDs, is that still a thing? I think those are going away. They sell, you know, just think of the things, some of the things that we have around here. They sell shirts. They sell clothing with the church logos on it. I mean, you know, you say, why? Why is this? They sell meals. You know, maybe if there's an event for the church, the church will charge people to come to the event. I mean, look, those, these, I mean, what's wrong with that? Aren't those things expensive? I'm going to show you what's wrong with that tonight and why we will do things and why we do th do things different. Many churches have auctions. They'll have auctions where they'll sell all kinds of garbage or whatever, you know, things to raise money for the church. So why do they do it? That's the first thing. Let's look at why churches sell merchandise. Why do they do it? Turn to 2 Peter chapter 2. There's two main reasons. I'm going to tell you why churches actually sell things in church. Okay, and then we're going to look at what the Bible says, and then I'll explain to you why we do things the way we do things. Look, we do everything the way the Bible says it. That's it. When, you're, when, you, when you follow the Bible, when your life is the Bible, you're a Baptist. All right, look at 2 Peter chapter 2. Here's the first reason, here's the first reason that churches sell merchandise. That churches sell things, they could sell books, they could sell media items. Look, many of the same things that we have. We hand out a lot of material here. We go out and we hand out, 
We hand out DVDs to people that have DVD players. We hand out pamphlets with the Bible Way to Heaven. We're out, I mean, look, that stuff's not free. That stuff's not free. We're just giving all that stuff away. There's, uh, I, I remember Pastor Anderson, some other friends of mine, used to make USB drives with all these sermons on them, and they just go out and they just give these things away by the thousands. We go on mission trips. What do we do? We literally bring boxes and just as many suitcases as we can possibly fit on the airplane full of what? Just full of, of media, full of sermons, full of Bible way to heavens, full of all these materials that we're bringing over um, to these different places that the mission trips are taking place. But none of them are sold ever. They're all given away. Okay? So here's the first reason. So why do churches do it? Why do churches do it? Look at 2 Peter chapter 2 and look at verse number 1. The Bible says, the first reason is this, they're false prophets. Okay, and here's what false prophets do. This is the first reason. I'm not saying they're all false prophets, people that sell in church, but one of the main reasons that people sell in church is because that's what false prophets do. Look at what the Bible says. But there were false prophets among the people, even as there shall be false teachers among you, who privily shall bring in damnable heresies, even denying the Lord that bought them, and shall bring upon themselves swift destruction. Okay, we get it. The Bible's saying there's going to be false prophets. There's false prophets today. I would say probably the majority of churches, even in our city here, have a false gospel. You know, the Catholic Church, I mean, Jehovah's Witnesses, all these different people um, have a false gospel. Look at verse number two. And many shall follow their pernicious ways, by reason of whom the way of truth shall be evil spoken of. Look at verse number three, though. And through covetousness shall they with feigned words make merchandise of you, whose judgment now of a long time lingereth not, and their damnation slumbereth not. The Bible here is saying that these false prophets, the main thing about them is they're covetous. They're covetous. That's what, you know what that means? That means they love money, basically is what he's talking about here. He says they love money. This is the, this is the Joel Osteen right here. That, that he's, literally, he's literally making merchandise of people, is what the Bible says. They'll make the merchandise of you. They're making, a, they're making merchandise of people, meaning they're after people to get money from them. This is the whole point of these false prophets. They exist to make money. If you ask yourself, why in the world would some, would some pastor who's preaching a false gospel who literally does not care what the Bible says. He's getting up, he's preaching um, things that, that are clearly against what the Bible says. You say, why would somebody like that do that? Well, one of the main reasons is money. That's why. This is the whole, you know, this church growth movement. It's just like we must fill the, the pews, we must fill the chairs at all costs. So we're going to just not preach what the Bible says. We're not going to preach anything that's offensive. Anything, look, the Bible, it, I mean, if you just, re, just pick a page in the Bible and read it, it's going to offend people today. That's just the way, it, I mean, you're not going to fill a church by preaching the whole counsel of God. All right? Look, this is the goal of these people is, is to just, like, water down the Word of God, pick and choose the Word of God, claim that their own words are the Word of God. Why? To get people to give them money. It's, it's very simple. So the first reason for this, for this merchandising in church, these people are just false prophets. These people, I mean, they just make merchandise of everything. They're just thinking of something that they can make money off of. All right? You say, okay, well, what about churches? What about churches that, that preach the Bible, that have, you know, the right gospel at least, that are still selling in churches. Because we actually went to a church before we moved to California. We went to an old IFB church, had the gospel right, pastor was saved, preaching the Bible, and they sold in church at times. There would be missionaries that would come in, or music groups that would come in, and they would set up a store in the back of the church. And they would sell all their materials and they would all, to, the, to the people in the church after church services. They would sell materials, they would sell you know, shirts, all these different things. So here's the thing, like, what's the big deal, right? What's the big deal? They're just raising money for a good church. In the best case scenario, where the pastor's saved, he's preaching the Bible, what's, what's the problem? 
They're just they're raising money for the church so the church can do more things. So the church can spread the gospel, right? It's interesting that many churches that do this, even churches that have the right gospel, are not soul winning as well. It's interesting those two things tend to go together. However, let's say you did have a soul winning church that was preaching the gospel and was doing these things. What's the problem? What's the problem? I'm going to explain to you what the problem is. Turn to Joshua chapter 6. I'm going to explain to you what the problem is. Other than the fact that Jesus said, don't make my, you know, look, we can just read what Jesus said and just say, let's pray and let's start the grill up and barbecue. All right? Because Jesus said, don't make my house a house of merchandise. We could just say, hey, end of sermon. Let's, let's, let's go eat. All right? But look at Joshua chapter 6. I want to kind of explain a concept to you about God about the Lord Jesus Christ. Look at Joshua chapter 6. Here we're seeing um, Jericho, all right? We're seeing Jericho, and we're seeing the, you know, this is the first city that they invaded after they crossed the Jordan River, the children of Israel, and they were not allowed to take anything. They were not allowed to take, they were to just destroy everything. You say, the, the people? No, everything. All the spoil all the cattle, all the livestock, everything. They were not to keep anything for themselves. Look at verse number 17 of Joshua chapter 6. The Bible says, And the city shall be accursed, even it and all that are in to the Lord. Only Rahab the harlot shall live. She's, of course, the one that helped the spies, if you remember that. She and all that are within her house, because she hid the messengers that we sent. And ye, in any wise, keep yourselves from the accursed thing. What was the accursed thing? Anything. Anything there. Lest ye make yourselves accursed, when ye take of the accursed thing, and make the camp of Israel a curse, and trouble it. But all that, now, now he explains what, the, what they're not to take. But all the silver and gold and vessels of brass and iron are consecrated unto the Lord. They go into the Lord's treasury, okay? They shall come into the treasury of the Lord. So the people shouted when the priest blew the trumpets, and it came to pass when the people heard the sound of the trumpet, and the people shouted with a great shout, that the wall fell down flat, so the people went up into the city, every man straight before him, and they took the city. And they utterly destroyed all that was in the city, both man and woman, young and old, ox and sheep and ass with the edge of the sword. They killed all the livestock. You're like, what sense does that make? It's like, couldn't they have used the, the live? I mean, here they are coming into a new land. They're this, you know, there's this group of people that's, you know, probably, you know, hundreds and hundreds of thousands of people, just the army itself. I mean, couldn't they use some livestock? What's, what's the problem here? Now turn to Joshua chapter 8. Now turn to Joshua chapter 8, just a couple chapters over. So in Joshua chapter 7, we find the story. They destroyed Jericho. They destroyed, they were to destroy everything, but there was one man, Achan, who kept some stuff. He kept some spoil for himself. Okay, and Joshua chapter 7 tells the story about Achan, how you know, he kept some things and God accursed Israel for it. And then they went to invade the next city of Ai and they lost the battle. And they're like, what in the world? It's like God said he's going to take care of us in these battles. And they go into this next city and they lose. And God tells them it's because somebody took of the spoil, of the accursed thing. They find Achan, they deal with that problem, and then they go into Ai, and of course, um, now that they've made things right, they continue their victories. Look at verse number 2 of Joshua chapter 8. But here's what's interesting. All that to say this. Look at eight, Joshua chapter 8 and verse number 2. And thou shalt do to Ai and her king as thou didst unto Jericho and her king. So he's saying you're going to invade Ai just like you invaded Jericho. But here's the difference right here. Only the spoil thereof and the cattle thereof shall ye take for a prey unto who? Unto yourselves. Lay thee in ambush for the city behind it. So, think of this story for a second. They go into Jericho, and they're not allowed to take anything. They're not allowed to keep anything. As a matter of fact, the, the spoil, the materials they give to the treasury of the Lord, but all the livestock they are to just slaughter and just like literally just waste. As a person, you would think that's, that's wasting that. You could think that it's just wasted. We could have used those sheep. We could have used those cows. We could have used those things. But God said, no, you can't keep any of the livestock. You can't keep any of the spoil. And then one of them, you know, betrays the Lord and does keep it and goes against what the Lord said. And it's a huge deal. 
And God says, I'm not going to be with you because, you know, you've taken of the accursed thing. You went against what I told you to do. And then in the, after they get that right, God says, yeah, you can keep it now. You can keep the spoil in this next city. So what's the point? Why? Why is that? Here's why, folks. Here's why that God wanted them to go into Jericho and go into the promised land. Why? For the right reasons. He didn't want them going into Jericho for the spoil. He didn't want them going into Jericho for the livestock, for the goods, all those different things. Look, he knew that he would need those things. He knew that they would need those things eventually, but he didn't want them to do that. Here's the reason that he did it. Because he wanted them to have faith first. He wanted them to have faith first. He's like, you, look, that's how God works. That's how God's works. You step out on faith first, and then God comes back behind you. That's how God works. Think of the sermon this morning. These people are stuck in these boxes in their lives. Why? Why? Because they don't have the faith to step out of the box. But guess what? Those of us who have stepped out of the box, we know that when we step out of the box, God takes care of us. But guess what? We had faith first. I'm talking about living your Christian life here. I'm not talking about salvation. Okay? But look, he wanted them to go into the promised land and have faith first, folks. And then he took care of them after. Turn to Matthew chapter 9. Look, folks, churches, you know, you say churches need money. You say, you know, you say the more money we have, you know, this is, what, this is how people think. Churches need money. And the more money that we have, the more we can do. Isn't that right? Wrong. That's wrong. Turn to Matthew chapter 9, and I'll explain to you why it's wrong. Look at what Jesus says in Matthew chapter 9, in verse number 37. I mean, what, how, churches don't need money? Are you crazy, pastor? What are you talking about? Look at Matthew chapter 9 and verse 37. Matthew chapter 9 and verse 37. Look what Jesus says. Then saith he unto his disciples, the harvest truly is plenteous. Jesus is saying, Jesus is saying, there's all these people out here that aren't saved. He's saying, look, he's saying what we see. He's saying, 99% of these people in Fresno are unsaved. All these people are going to go to hell. This is what he's saying. The harvest is plenteous. He's like, there's wheat everywhere, is what he's saying. And then you look what he says, but the laborers are few. Does he say the money is few? Does he say that the harvest is plenteous, but we don't have enough money? No, you know what he said? Look what he says. Pray you, therefore, the Lord of the harvest, that he will send forth more money? He says, pray therefore the Lord of the harvest that he will send forth laborers into his harvest. Look, folks, we need people, not money. That's what Jesus said. Jesus said, we, you know what we need? We need people that will put faith first. We, we don't need money. This is, this is the mistake people make. This is a mistake people make in their life. People think, look, they're pragmatic. I get it. I'm a logical person. I'm an engineer. I get it. I get how people think this way. People just think, if I just had more money, if I just had more money, then, then like, I mean, I, I just, I got so many bills. I, I got, you know, I got, I got utility bills. I got, I got these payments. I got rent. I got mortgage. I, I just, if, if I just had more money, then I could serve the Lord. I've actually known people who've quit the Christian life and they said, you know what? I'm just going to go make money and as soon as I have a bunch of money, I'm going to come back and I'm going to help um, this ministry and I'm going to be able to do so much more for the Lord. It, what in the world? That is a path that people will never come back from if Christians go down that road. Because guess what? We don't need money. We need faith-filled people. That's what we need. You say, but what about, the, what about the bills and the lights and all that? Faith first. That's what I say to that. Faith first. Look, folks, nothing will ever be for sale here. Ever. As long as I am the pastor of this church, nothing will ever be for sale at this church. To keep our focus is the main thing. Why? For, for one reason, because we will keep faith first here. 
Think, you know, I think about the ministry and being in the ministry, and I haven't been in the ministry that long. You know, I've been a pastor for a little over a year now, and I think about the stresses of the ministry. Look, the stresses of the ministry are real. It's, it's, a, it's, it's very stressful at times. It's very joyful, but it's very stressful at times. You say, what percentage of that stress in the ministry is, is money or monetary? I'm going to tell you, zero. Zero. And, and to, be, to be honest with you, in my, in my personal life, it's the same. In my personal life, you know, there's things in, in your life that you got to maybe handle things and problems arise and life has peaks and valleys. We get that. But in my personal life, what, what amount of stress do you have about money in your personal life, Pastor? Zero. That's what. Zero. Look, I'm not... We, we, we talk, I preach many sermons on being smart and being biblical with your money. I'm not some fool that's out there just spending everything on, on worthless things and going into a bunch of debt. But the Bible tells us that. What do I need to care about money for? All I need to do is just do what the Bible says. That's it. I just have faith, faith, that if I follow what the Bible says for my finances, that I'll be fine. And it works. Imagine that. But as far as the church goes... We don't need money. We need people. We need faith-filled people. And look, I've had, I've had people have this backwards and upside down since I've been, in, even as a satellite leader. I remember I had one guy years ago in the satellite ministry come up to me, and this guy was just really obsessed with money. And he came up to me, and like, he would just like to throw in little things about how much money he gave to the church and things like that. And I'm just like, I mean, I don't want to be insulting, but I'm just like, oh, you know, because I literally don't care. I literally don't care. And he was, then he came to me at one time, and this person came to me, and he wanted to make a decision in his life that was clearly the wrong biblical decision. It was clearly just like a sinful decision, but one of the reasons that he came to me, he said, he said, but if I make this decision, pastor, I can give more money to the church. And I'm just like, what in the world? But this is the problem that people will have if they get these things out of order. Look, it's faith first. God will take care of everything else. You can't flip these things around on your head. Look, there will never be anything for sale here, ever. The first reason is because we will have faith first in this church. We will have faith first. And here's another reason. Here's another reason that Jesus didn't want the house of God being a house of merchandise. Turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 11. Turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 11. Here's another reason that nothing should ever be for sale in the church. The reason is this. I mean, if you, if you read the New Testament, Paul, I mean, who wrote most of the New Testament through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, he's talking about how in the world do we get these, these Jews and these Gentiles all together in the same faith to, be, to, to get along in a church? And, and he's talking about things that you should eat, things you don't eat, different cultures. All coming together in, you know, in Christ is, is a big theme of some of the letters that Paul writes. But here's, here's one of the main reasons, or here's one big problem that comes with selling things in church or charging for things in church. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 11. I'll just tell you the answer right now. But here's the thing. It divides the church. The church is to be of unity. The church is to come together and be together. It divides the church. Look at verse number 18 of 1 Corinthians chapter 11. They were having problems with this church in, in Corinth um, just doing the Lord's Supper. You know, something that they were to get together and do to remember the sacrifice of the Lord Jesus Christ. To remember Jesus Christ's death on the cross, to remember his body that was broken, to remember his blood that was shed for our sins. This is the purpose of the Lord's Supper. And look what these people turned it into. It says, for, first of all, when you come together in the church, I hear that there be divisions among you. Look, there, there was something that they were doing that was dividing people. Look, if something's going on in the church that's dividing people in the church, that's bad because the church is supposed to be in unity. For there must also be heresies among you, for that they which are approved be made manifest among you. When you come together, therefore, in one place, this is not to eat the Lord's Supper. He's like, you're not doing it right. Why? What are they doing? Look what he says. For in eating, everyone taketh before other his own supper, and one is hungry, and another is drunken. He says what? Have you not houses to eat and drink in? 
Or despise you the church of God and shame them that have not? What shall I say to you? Shall I praise you in this? I praise you not. You know what they were doing? They were like, they were turning the Lord's Supper into like this. Imagine, like, we're pretty good at potlucks here. Okay, imagine if we had a potluck and like, if you didn't bring anything, you don't eat. <laughs> That's what they were doing. So they were having a, a, a potluck. People were bringing this elaborate food and drink. And some people were just gorging themselves on all this food. And the other people, they had nothing to eat. Imagine like having somebody stand in the line being like, did, what did you bring? You just brought a, a box of cookies from Costco? No. You go in this line. Look, that's what was happening here. And it was causing divisions in the church. Look, if you start selling things in the church, that's exactly what will happen. You start charging for events. You know, the ladies' supper. We're going to go to a really nice ladies' supper. And everyone has to pay $60 to get in. Well, look, I mean, there's people in the church that maybe could afford that. There's people in the church that maybe can't afford that. Well, that's a bigger deal. And then, you know, it's just, it causes division in the church, and it will never happen here. Okay? Everything will always be free here. You say, well, how in the world? It turned to Malachi chapter 3. How in the world is the church going to pay its bills? Look, I, I don't preach about money, like, ever. But, I mean, the Bible's pretty clear that, 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 you know, the church is to be taken care of. Think about Acts. We're studying through the book of Acts. The beginning of the book of Acts, Acts 1, 2, 3, and 4. At the end of Acts chapter 4, what did you have? You had all these people being added to the church, right? You had all these people being added to the church. And then they just gave everything um, to the church and... Everything was fine. But the point is, they were added to the church first. And they gave willingly. Okay? It doesn't say that people were added to the church and then they started selling t-shirts. Okay? Or they started making, you know, things that they could sell to everybody. I mean, that's not what it says. Look at Malachi chapter 3 and verse number 8. The Bible says, Will a man rob God? Yet ye have robbed me. But you say, Wherein have we robbed thee? He says, In tithes and offerings. This is where the church gets its money. The church gets its money from two places. It gets its money from two places. The first one is the tithe, which the Bible teaches is 10% of you know, a person's income. And look, that's between you and God. That's between you and God. That's not you know, up to me to get involved in that or anything like that. The Bible says that that 10% is just God's. Whether you give it to him or not, it's God's. Okay. And then there's other things that just offerings. Just offerings. People just give. You know, we've had many offerings here. You know, sometimes that... You know, we need something, and someone will just pay for it. That's an offering. You know, we need, a, we need a floor, or we need some insulation, or we need something, and people will just offer it. We need a, a new camera, and people will just offer those things. That's, that's just an offering. People just pay for it. They don't go and they don't buy a, a, a picture, or they don't buy a trinket, and then the church has a, a bake sale or something to, to try to convince you. to. It's really actually pretty pitiful when you think about it. Because people are supposed to give tithes and offerings. And to just like, to just like, like we've been to like auctions at Christian schools, my wife and I, before we were Baptists, before I was even saved. We go to these auctions, you know, to raise money um, for the church. And it's just like this super selfish, prideful situation where people want to be the one that bids the most on, on something. And then they feel really good about it. But here's the thing. Tithes and especially offerings, it's, it's faith. It's faith. It's not, I'm not getting something out of it. I mean, I'm not getting something out of that. It, you know, this, I'm not going to get a t-shirt out of it. I'm not going to get a, a painting out of it. It's just, it's this whole idea of faith first. That's the whole point of tithes and offerings. All this selling, all this pride, all this selfishness, trying to like, trick people and convince people to give money to the church. It's, it's really pathetic, actually. And it's totally unbiblical. All we need here, folks, look, all we need here is faith-filled people. That's it. That's all we need. You want to get, you know, just like this morning, you want to exit that box? Good luck exiting that box with no faith. It's just you're not going to be able to do it. You're not going to be able to do it. And, I mean, I remember when we moved here. This is the way God works. If you get nothing out of this sermon, just remember this. The way God works is you have to step out on faith first. When we moved to California, it was the first time in my entire life 
that I had ever just, I had ever just stepped out on faith. I mean, I literally, I can still remember the terror of the feeling. I literally quit my job before I had another job. I have never done that. And I was just like, you know what? I know this is the box I need to get out of. I know this is what I need to do. I know this is where we need to go in our Christian lives. I know this. Nothing's going to stop me. I'm just stepping out on faith. It was like a day or two later that I had a job. Faith first. We are not to make the house of God a house of merchandise. Everything will always be free here. And, you know, it's probably something that's inevitably going to happen as the church grows. We'll be able to do extra things. But you say, well, what if, what if you want to have, provide T-shirts, but we don't have the money for it? Then we just don't have those things. We're not going to like, provide things and then charge you for it. That's never going to happen because it's against what the Bible says. All the things that we send out with you soul winning, all the things that you, know, you have from this church, it's just going to be provided by the church. And we're not ever going to make, we're never going to sell anything. We're not going to sell a cup of coffee in this church ever. Okay, because look, first of all, Jesus got mad. And Jesus is the head of this church. So if this made Jesus angry, we should pay attention to it. And like I said, we could, have, we could have ended the sermon after five minutes. But that's the main thing, is that God just, he wants us to step out on faith. Look, your, your offering is, is it's you stepping out on faith. You know, your tithe that you give, just, you're just reading the Bible and say, this is what the Bible says, and bam, that's it. And you're just, you're just stepping out of these boxes on faith. If you don't have faith, you're going to be locked in boxes for your entire Christian life, and you'll do nothing. You'll do nothing in your life. So, no, we will never make the house of God a house of merchandise. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer.